We've, we've got to move forward with our eyes wide open, but not in fear, right? God's in control, right? Marriage is not going away, right? We've got to kind of take a step back and say, uh, this child does not belong to me. They belong to God. Welcome to the Focus on the Family broadcast, helping families thrive. Uh, Mark, welcome to the program. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Let me start here. Uh, You do such incredible work uh, in extensive research as a sociologist uh, there with the University of Texas. Um, Talk about the culture, where we're at today when it comes to sexuality. What's the big picture? Uh, The big picture is it's changing fairly rapidly, which is kind of weird because you think this is the oldest of human behaviors in some ways. Right. Um, And yet, you know, as we're mapping it, things are quite dynamic in the last 10, 15, 20, 30 years. So, and and, and then even in the last year or so, there's so much turmoil over, um, uh, now we have transgender identities and uh, the Me Too movement. And so there's there's a lot going on mm-hmm. uh, in, in the culture around sex and sexuality. So I, I look at our, our relationship behavior and say, what's going on, you know, using language that's sort of, you know, what percentage of the people uh, are having premarital sex, what percentage of the people are having, um, you know, are getting married, by what age, uh, what share of the population is divorced, what's the average age at which people get married, and and how are these things shaped by the surrounding culture? Yeah, which is really important. Mark, let me ask you about that, because there's something, I don't know when this started, but the loneliness index. And again, you're a Mm -hmm. researcher, you're probably, uh, you know, up to speed on these things. But what I heard when that last came out in the last 12 months at some point is that it's the highest it's ever been. Yeah. And yet you look at all the digital <laughs> connection, you look at the physical intimacy, you always mm-hmm. hear this on college campuses, you know, the hookup culture, et cetera. So there's this appetite for everything but true intimacy, right. emotional intimacy. Right. It feels uh, scary. I mean, talking to a person feels scarier than sleeping with them. I that, mean, that just is amazing it is. to me. Hard to conceive of. Now, really. why do you think, as a researcher, that is happening from a human perspective? What is yeah. allowing us to mm-hmm. really transition uh, those appetites to say, "I'm just interested in a physical relationship with you. I don't, I don't want an emotional right. well, attachment." One of the key things and themes in this latest book of mine is that men are kind of in charge of the the mating market out there today, and I think and have been for quite some time. Now, uh, that sounds shocking because we're so empowering of women. Yeah. Explain why you think as a researcher that men are actually right. in control today. I don't today. just think they're in control. They are in control. <laughs> okay. I like that response <laughs> as a researcher. Tell me why. Right. Well, uh, the, the price of sex has dropped. And I know people say, why are you talking about the price of sex? We shouldn't talk about it this way. But uh, it, it is occurring. I mean, we, we talk about... Um, you know, saving sex till marriage, it's a great gift. I mean, you're using exchange economic language in that sense, right? So sex comes at a cost, but the cost is lower than it has ever been uh, hmm. due to a variety of things. Um, the first of those is sort of the, the wide uptake of contraception, which is the, the idea that, uh, you know, sex does not necessarily, we can prevent fertility, right? We can prevent the conception of a child Um, that means sex is less risky to her. So she has lost this kind of uh, reason to delay, right? Then you add into this more recently pornography, which gives more outlet for male sexual demand, so to speak, right? Well, what what happens when more supply has been inserted into the, the sort of the relationship market? Well, the price of the real thing goes down. She feels like she's has to compete huh. with this image on the screen. Competition, that's all economic language, right? And she's right. She f- is competing with it. She feels disempowered by it because she is, right? Because he has more options for his demand. So that, and then even online dating, which you know can be utilized for good, is, is far more often utilized uh, for opportunistic Men, then, then we think uh, one of one of the interesting things about uh, the online dating world. Um, Tinder's popular, 
but I, Bumble started recently, and it was started so that it gave power to women to make the first move. There's a, there's a direct indication that women are not in control of this 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 industry and how it operates because we've had to create something new because there's this felt demand that men are in charge. Huh. So men are in charge across the board on this stuff. This is why uh, women can still break up with them, and they do, but women do not feel like they can really get what they want. Let me ask you in the context of the Me Too movement then, mm -hmm. is that also a, an expression of that power or that desire to right. be more in charge of this? Right. So I'm optimistic about it in, in the sense of people are demanding better behavior, women of men especially, and they should. I mean, that should be just a, a baseline. You expect dignity, security, uh, and, and honor in, in uh, how a man treats a woman, but they're not feeling like they're getting that. And so we've seen kind of the reemergence of uh, almost a, a little women's cartel of saying, hey, we're sick of this, and we want better treatment. So I'm very happy to see that. One of the things I think is self-limiting about it is that, you know, tweeting this stuff or getting particular people fired and it's mostly like in big industry and uh, well, media, I, politics, etc. Exactly. Uh, I don't think it affects regular people very much. And nothing about the Me Too movement really alters the underlying dynamics that men still have control in the mating market in general. Hey, Mark, you mentioned also in your book uh, about the incentive for women to wait and how that has kind of changed, obviously, over the years in part because women no longer need kind of the historic uh, skill set of men, yes. provide and protect. Correct. Why, with that function changing in modernity, why are women more at risk? So they need marriage less than they used to, right? In the, hmm. in the classic sense, marriage uh, classically was sort of the, the effective transfer of men's resources to women and the children that they have had together, a right? Joint, and, and joint to, benefit. And to protection, yeah. Uh, it was foundational. People built something together, so to speak. And now we, 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 our, our mentality and meaning to marriage has shifted more towards uh, an idea of this is a capstone. Nobody needs it anymore, right? Women go to college, men go to college, although we overestimate how many people actually go to college and finish college. It's something... People say, I'm going to do that after I've built a career, got some assets, bought a house, and then, then I'll become marriageable and marketable. But that works better for men than for women because women feel more vulnerable when they're 28 and single or when they're 30 and dating and he hasn't asked her to marry him yet. And she's like, Am I, is it time to fish or cut bait? Right. You know, uh, so... At each of these stages, it still appears very realistically to me that men call the shots in how this, this, this happens. It's not just about men asking women to marry them. It's, um, it's, it's what leads up to that, right? And one of the, 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 the problems is here is that uh, women are, are the gatekeepers to sex, right? I mean, there's, that's a realistic statement that feminists hate when I say it. Idealists don't like the sound of it, but it's just true, okay? I mean, women are the gatekeepers in consensual relationships. Uh, he prefers easier access. The average man's thresholds to having sex with a woman are lower than the average woman's. Mm -hmm. So when she is quicker to introduce sex into a relationship that pleases him, at least in the short run, but it tends to slow a relationship down, right? Uh. And then she starts thinking, oh, well, can I get him to move in with me, right? It's a step towards marriage. But she doesn't realize that this is a, a major bargaining chip. And f for the last data collection that we did to see that sex is introduced in a relationship before the relationship is even defined as a thing means she's trading this extremely valuable resource uh, f way ahead of its proper time. Yeah, and that connects back to your supply and demand comment, that oversupply creates cheaper demand, right? Right. I mean, so lots of these things are about how technology shapes um, culture, right? Mm. Yeah. So 
it's not just contraception. It's pornography gives him more options. Online dating gives him more options. She might say, oh, I've, I have options too. There are men looking at me, but she's a lot more picky about it than sure. he is. Hmm. Uh, Mark, you're banking off of research. You're not just saying, this is my opinion. You're no. saying, this is what the research shows. <laughs> right. And as I'm tracking along with you, I'm kind of curious, if men have the power in in the current um, economy mm-hmm. of, of sexuality, if you will, in the culture, but women have the kind of the yes or no factor. I, mm-hmm. Explain mm-hmm. the difference between those two and what sure. the research would indicate is the healthiest. Right. Well, the healthiest thing, obviously, is uh, if it, more women than men want to marry, generally. And so the healthiest thing, of course, is to, to hold on to this thing of great value until he has paid the highest price, right? Has signaled sacrifice, commitment, stick-to-itiveness, given gifts, been there, traveled to see her, all of these things that when we look at the, the, the market today, like, they're not doing that at all. Mm. I was talking to a friend of mine. Uh, he was, his, his niece was living with uh, his family um, for a while, and she had a boyfriend of sorts an hour north of Dallas, and he would expect her to come see him, right? And the friend of mine said, you know, I think you have this backwards, right? He needs to signal sacrifice if he's really serious about you. And until he does, um, you should be a lot more guarded in your affections. How did she respond to that? You know, I, these things tend to open women's eyes. They, it's an awkward moment, in part because they know it's true, and often they know they haven't lived up to it, and they don't know if they, if they can put the genie back in the box, mm. which is difficult because... Economists of, of, of this stuff uh, will say once a relationship has added sex, it is very difficult to, 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 to cease it and, to, for the, and, and the relationship survive. One of my interviewees in my next book, I just uh, spoken with her a couple of weeks ago, she actually accomplished that, right? They actually had conceived a child on the, the first time they had had uh, intercourse. And this was not what she had planned, not what she had intended to do. Um, she said this was a mistake. Her mother and father were very disappointed, etc. And yet, she thinks very clearly about how a relationship is to, to develop. And so she said, okay, we've got to reset this, right? And it can be done, but there's a great risk to it. It may not work. It often doesn't work, but it can work. So... The, the wisest thing, of course, is waiting till he pays the highest price. But his thresholds are lower than that, right? Uh, and if women signal that that's not required, then um, he's happy to pay less, mm. typically speaking. Uh, Dr. Regner, so let me ask you about this, because, again, most of our listeners are Christians. And this is right at the crux of the whole issue. We're in modernity, this modern culture that unfortunately looks a lot like the Roman Empire culture, right? Uh, Sexuality, kind of unrestrained. Right. Uh, The things we read about with Emperor Nero and what was taking place, nothing new under the sun. So as Christians living in this culture um, and as parents trying to raise kids in such a way to honor the Lord, Mm -hmm. to understand his design for marriage, what it means to be male and female, made in the image of God, to come together as one flesh, in the bond of marriage, the very institution that God created, right. um, how can we do that effectively with the onslaught of culture mm-hmm. constantly right. saying to our children, no, 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 go this way, an easier way, a more selfish way, mm-hmm. a less mm-hmm. God-centered way. Right. I mean, it's daunting for parents today to go up against Hollywood and right. the politics of the culture. And, and you're in it. You're in yeah. a university setting. What would you say to us moms and dads? Yeah. The funny thing is parents, uh, I think they have good impulses in this domain. Um, Those who can feel like they can talk frankly do talk frankly, and they make clear their expectations and hopes for their children. At the same time, you have to realize your children are not uh, little automatons. They have freedom, you know, and and, and they will express that freedom. I'm also worried on the on the flip side that sometimes parents put their children under their thumb. 
and, and, and keep saying, no, no, it's too risky to, to be in a relationship, um, not just for purposes of, of, of sexual risk, but also sort of, oh, you're too young to, 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 to consider this. Um, they'll do this to college students, uh, their own children. They'll say, um, don't get serious, right? Wait till you're after done with college. Wait till I mean, so parents are actually feeding into the the delay mentality around marriage because marriage seems like such a big deal, and it is a big deal. Uh, but parents can be unwittingly feeding this later, later, later mm-hmm. thing. And I, you know, I wrote several years ago. Like, I mean, if you reasonably expect your child to be living chastely into their 30s, I mean, I think that the odds are against that, frankly. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I think there's a delicate balance we have to, uh, and a dance we have to do with children to instruct, but also sort of give freedom to to, to their, their decision-making, and to envelop them in community, know who their friends are, right? I mean, you can sculpt who they hang out with, right? Um, watch their electronics usage. If they want one social media platform, one only, right? I think having four or five is ridiculous and yeah. dangerous, right? Even one can be dangerous. So you, we've, we've got to move forward with our eyes wide open, but not in fear, right? God's in control, right? Marriage is not going away, right? Uh, our children will make mistakes, we hope they're not significant ones, but some of them do. But some of them learn from those mistakes, and they become part of uh, a renewal of faith, too. So we've got to kind of take a step back and say, uh, this child does not belong to me. They belong to God. Yeah. But I'm going to do my best to sculpt them in in positive directions. And that's, you know, for the most part, praying for them, instructing them is about all you can do. You can't control them. Right. And that I, I take that point uh, right. wisely. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mark, let me also raise this issue because you've talked about the empowerment of women. And one of the things when cultures seem to be healthy, and again, I'm not a researcher, so correct me if I'm wrong. But when you see a culture that's thriving, it's usually because women have done exactly what you're talking about. There's a high cost to me. And that means if you, if you want me physically emotionally, intellectually, that means we get married. Right Now, for most people hearing that, that is so old-fashioned. Hmm. But it actually is the tried and true formula of human interaction, right. isn't it? So I think the question becomes, when we look at the Me Too movement and those other things, really it's interesting to me, the formula is how do we empower women to, in better ways, stronger ways, control the male appetite? Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. to domesticate yeah. men into right. a economic relationship. If you want me, that means we do this. Mm-hmm. How does a culture ever get back to that? Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm not optimistic uh, in the short run about how our culture getting back to that. But I do think we can think of it in terms of subcultures getting back to that. And, and, and sort of congregations, youth groups, churches— denominations, um, movements. Parental role modeling. Right. So uh, it may be too much to hope for Western civilization to recover uh, some of these, these ideas in the short run. But you're absolutely right that uh, so monogamous marriage, and, and, and this is from a study of econom- economists, anthropologists, and uh, psychologists, monogamous marriage is, is responsible for a, a great deal of... Uh, Western civilizations advance and, 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 and the positive and healthy treatment of women around the world. So what is the ideal? Let's look back to Genesis, right? God made man in his image, and two shall become one flesh, uh, and what God has brought together, let no one put asunder. Yeah. And, and, and that's really a, re- a reshaping of, of the, the old impulse that has never gone away among men to have access to more than one woman. I mean, it, it remains true today that even married men's threshold for sleeping with somebody is going to be lower than married women's, right? And it happens. Uh, how, do we, how do we 
curb that? Well, social control, right? And, and, and good teaching and things like that. So, uh, because left to a, a, the state of nature, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure we want to see it, right? Because state of nature uh, is, is, is extremely male-dominated, and um, it's harsh for women, it's violent, and it's, it's not conducive to a, a healthy democracy and a healthy economy. And yeah. the Romans figured that out uh, a little bit too late. Well, and I think that's the, that's the, the final question, the future. Um, as a researcher, you must think about where these patterns are going. Mm. And although you may not have hope for restoration or full restoration, where do you see Western civilization 100 years from now, maybe 500 years from now? What's happened? Yeah, 500 is a little bit far to map out. Uh, even 100 years is far. In the book, in the last chapter, I map out to 2030. Okay, good. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. I'll go, I'll go for more. I was, okay. I was okay. pushing you for more, but I'll go with 2030. <laughs> Uh, I mean, a hundred years out is uh, all sorts of things can happen. Um, I mean, nobody should take for granted the survival of their own nation state, frankly, because nation states come and go. Um, Twenty thirty, I think, in, in in the short run, I don't see anything to curb sort of this falling price of sex. Right? We start to hear more about um, technology creating uh, sex dolls and things like that. I you know, I think that's it's going to catch on a little bit. But it's not just for men. It, I mean, uh, if anybody has seen, and I'm not going to endorse it, but the, the, the movie Her, it's about people falling in love with operating systems, right? And, and right. you know, th think about I mean, we, we can be humorous about it, but think if an operating system, uh, a nice, handsome, rugged male voice, you know, reads a woman's emails and knows exactly what she likes and dislikes, it can engage in intelligent conversations with her Whereas her husband, like, you know, he can never remember. What is it that you like? What's your size? I mean, what to, um, what kind of food do you like? I mean, we're yeah. always sort of, you know, no, it's interesting, you're forgetting for this umpteenth time yeah, where the, machines never forget. That emotional attachment. It'd be a more of an emotional attachment. I, I honestly think that's a risk. And in the domain of technology, human beings seem bent on making it um, work to their personal sexual interests, which is frustrating as, a, as an observer because you see what it does to genuine in-person human relating, and it does to the marriage rate. I mean, starting in the 70s and accelerating even cl closer to the year 2000, um, marriage among kind of 20, 30-somethings has declined in the United States, but it's not only here. We're, we're exporting some of our worst impulses. Mm -hmm. Well, Mark, this has been a great discussion, and I so appreciate what you've had to share, and you've got this wonderful book out, uh, Cheap Sex and the Transformation of Men, Marriage, and Monogamy. I would say it's in addition to the book of Proverbs. <laughs> you know, this is the stuff that we know as believers in Christ, and yet um, is so obscured by the culture around us. And it's a good reminder from a, a professional who's working in the research field as a university professor. Thank you for what you're doing. Sorry for the heat that you take to, in being a realist. And uh, keep on doing it because we need to know what's true. I love that picture of Jesus before Pontius Pilate talking about what is truth. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. really your job. Jesus yeah. came to testify to the truth. And part of that truth is the idea of marriage and God's institution of marriage and how it's reflected in humanity today. And not everybody wants to hear that truth. And I am proud of you for doing it. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Jim. I've... I've come to find that out, that not everybody wants to hear this stuff. Yeah. Even, you know, both from left, right, Christians and non-Christians. Yeah. I mean, it can be a tough swallow for a lot of people. So uh, I'm still in business and intend to keep writing until um, good Lord calls me home. That's it. Well, thanks again for being with us. You're welcome. Hey, I'm John Fuller, and thanks for watching. Get more info about Focus over here and more from our guests over there. And be sure to subscribe to our channel as well.